Welcome to Codex, History of Video Games. My name's Tyler Osby. And I'm Mike Coletta. And this week, we're going to talk more about some Kirby games. We've got a couple in the hopper today. Kirby's Pinball Land, which you were pleasantly surprised by. Pleasantly and Kirby's surprised. Dream Land 2. Yeah, I have to apologize to Kirby's Pinball Land. Okay, because I said, we're not going to cover that last episode because it's just a pinball game. There's a lot more going on to it. It's more than that. just pinball? Yeah, it's, it's more than just pinball. That could be the slogan for Kirby's Pinball Land. It's more than just pinball. So let's get into that right now. It was published by Nintendo, but developed by HAL Laboratory. The release dates, oh, we're in the Grime Facts now. I didn't say that, but we're in it. We're just jumping right into it. Just, so, just really diving in. Just diving right in. So the cool thing about this that I thought was interesting, release date wise, in Japan, it's November 27th. In North America, November 30th. And in the EU, December 1st. All 1993. So within like a week, it all That's came out. That's uncommon for the early 90s. Yeah, very uncommon. But the it was for the Game Boy initially. The best way to play now is probably the Game Boy or an emulator. And it was available on the 3DS Virtual Store. But I believe the 3DS Virtual Store is now gone. Yep. So All if you 3DS Store stuff is yeah, Gunzo. Unless you got it when the getting was good, it's probably gone. Um, or you got to hack 3DS. We got to hack 3DS. We're not going to say that. We're not going to encourage that behavior on here. But it is a thing. We want to. We want to acknowledge it exists, mm -hmm. but we don't encourage it. Okay. Because we're not. Pirates. I encourage hacking your 3DS. I don't encourage piracy. That's right. That's right. Okay. Good job. Good job. We really covered ourselves there legally. Okay. So. <laughs> I'm sure Nintendo is real mad at us. Oh, Nintendo is like, they're actually listening every week and just checking, like, did Tyler and Mike mess this up? Did they mess just it up this waiting week? waiting for us to slip We're up. ready. We're ready. We're tired of them claiming that Shigeru Miyamoto is a friend of their podcast. For some <laughs> of it. So the, the best way to play it, it's not on the Switch Online emulator either. I played it on my Miyu Mini. But yeah, it's not. It's not on the Switch Online emulator. I checked it, and it's not hmm. there. Unless they have a Game Boy Advance version that I'm unaware of. I just checked the Game there Boy. There was Kirby Tilt and Tumble for... Was that a Game Boy Advance? That Kirby? was Game Boy. And that that Game is Boy on Color. there. Oh, that was Game Boy Color because it had the like the mm -hmm. gyro stuff. But, that, but that is on there. That is on the Switch Online emulator, emulator oh. store. Store? Online thing. Switch Online emulator. Uh, but the other thing that we want to go... So I, would, I played it with my MiU Mini. Uh, full disclosure. Love the MiU Mini. We do support that here. We love it. But of we course, all legally own the game. Tyler and I own legal copies of every single everything. game, yeah. everything on there. So that's how I would play it if if uh, if you were looking to do that. According to VG Chart, which as I've mentioned before, I'm very skeptical about, but we don't have anything else to go off of. This game shipped 2.19 million copies, which that seems pretty, pretty good. good. It's referred to by a lot of people, by the way, as like one of the better games to come out on Game Boy in 1993. So. There's that going for it too. Genre or gameplay style is pinball. Average time to complete approximately 1.5 to 2.5 hours, depending on how completionist you are. But honestly, that's like to play it straight through and beat the boss. There really is no beating this game, and we'll get into why that is. Is it is the is there like replay value if it's just like I just want to play a game of, of yeah. uh pinball? Because like it's like putting a, a time frame on on a Tetris game, like time to beat Tetris. Like, I... and you can beat it. There are bosses, okay. and you beat this game. But once you beat it, it just goes right back to the beginning again because you're going for a high score. That's kind of gotcha. where it is. So, so yeah, so that's that's the loop. Is you just keep playing it. You maybe you beat it every time you play it, but you you keep playing to just try to get higher higher and higher score. Yeah, and when a lot of the times just like with most pinball there's a there's a luck aspect to it too, right? Mm -hmm. You're good you're getting lucky with how the ball bounces sometimes as well. But the game ranking score is 70% and that's just because like we metacritic didn't exist back then, so we go off of game rankings. So, gameplay wise, this is where I have to forgive Kirby's Pinball Land, like I mentioned the whole just pinball thing, but they really do a good job at adding some feeling of progression. And like towards pinball that I just wouldn't really expect. So we'll just kind of go through it right now. So you start at the bottom. Well, okay, you start loading up the game, and there's three different tables to choose. And you actually use the pinball controls, which is just the A button on the right and any of the D-pad buttons. Use the left flipper. That's kind of how it works. And you can select one of three tables. Okay. You select the table you want to play on. Then each table has three levels to it. 
like you actually move up in screens. So you go over and the screen transitions to a new one and there's new flippers and you move your way up like that from there. But you oh. can fall down too. So you can go down the levels as well. This is kind of something that I just didn't know. And I'm, I'm glad I covered this, honestly, because I feel like I kind of talked about this game like it was just a pinball game when there's a little bit yeah. more. So, and we'll talk about the development history of why that is. So you launch up to the level of the board and each board has an empty space above it where you can move to the next level. And each of their own board has their own mechanics. So like I played a board where there was a slot machine and I played another board where there's these chicken eggs hatching and you hatch them by hitting them. But then occasionally a person comes down, like a little, little guy comes down and tries to take the, the chicken or the egg and you got to hit them away too. So there's like a strategy. And then the chickens, when they hatch, move up to where the guy is. And that's how you like complete the mission, the level, get the star essentially. Um, but I, I got really invested in these chickens. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Like, <laughs> I actually got like really carried because I almost got it and then I lost. But the goal is to beat the boss in all three tables. And there's three levels and then a boss fight on each table. So the three tables are based on Kirby. So there's the Wispy Woods, there's Cracko, the boss Cracko, and then there's the Poppy Brothers. So those are the three different levels that you can play as. On each level of the table, there's a warp star. If you hit the warp star on the first level, it takes you back to the table selection screen. If you hit the warp star on the second level, there's a mini game for more points. And then if you hit the warp star on the third level, that takes you to the boss. So that chicken game I was playing, if I'd have gotten all three chickens, the warp star would have appeared and I would have gone to the boss. Fun fact, I never got to a boss. This game oh, is really hard. You to get good. Okay. Yeah, I got to get good. Okay, I'm amateur. So that's, that's like one of the things with the mechanics as far as it goes. After you beat all the bosses, and each boss has like a pinball mechanic that you got to do, right? You fight King DDD, okay? And if you beat King DDD, this is where the game doesn't really end. You just go back to the tables to keep pumping up your score, trying to get the highest score. Okay, you never, so you keep your score when it starts over and you're mm -hmm. just like continuing. You just through. keep okay. going. You can just keep playing it over and over again. I don't know what the record high score is. I probably should have looked that up to see like, do you want to look it up on Twin Galaxies? Does Twin Galaxies have Twin a record Galaxies. for this? Yeah, right? I'm, I'm thinking they're the only ones that have records like this, right? They got Let's it. Let's see. Twin Galaxies, Kirby's Pinball Land. It's uh, gotta be on number one is... Uh, you're probably playing the game for hours to get a high score. Yeah, probably. Julian Ozuka has 15,683,160 points. It does not say how long it took them, but it, okay. the status of this is undisputed. Okay, because here's the thing for me. I never broke a million, so I'm nowhere close to Julian, okay? Dang. Everyone respect Julian and their game, okay? So this is what I found interesting about the gameplay, though, is like when you play pinball in an arcade, if your ball goes down the drain in between the two flippers, it's just over, right? That's pretty much what we're used to. You might get like a ball save or something like that, or you might have unlocked extra balls. In Kirby's Pinball Land, you get a skill shot, which is kind of interesting. So Kirby as a ball is the ball, right? And he falls down, and you land on this plunger mechanic that goes down, and then when it hits the bottom, you need to hit A to spring him back up. There's like a timing part of it. And you can't spam the A button here. Like if you're like me and you're impatient and you spam the A button, you're going to lose. And that skill shot, it keeps going every time you fall down the final drain at the very bottom. But it gets harder and harder mm. as you do it. So the timing. So there is like skill to saving the ball in this game, which I thought was really cool. Um, and you have to like, you have to push A right when Kirby reaches the bottom of the launcher, but that timing changes. So there is a power up. It's the Maxim tomato that we all know and love, and it makes it so the tomato blocks the drain on the level. So if you get the Maxim tomato, it blocks the drain, and you can just play without having to worry. Gotcha. About it kind of gives you a freebie. Yeah, exactly. And it sits up there for a certain period of time. So you can gain lives by spelling the word extra that you get on the table selection screen, but those words, those letters only appear after you beat a boss. So you have to like not select a table and hit all the extra words. So there's like skill in getting an extra life too. I never got past like even getting remotely close to a boss. I played Dang. it for a good like 20 to 30 minutes, like just playing around with it. And it, it was really fun, but I was like, this is, I feel like I'm fighting a losing battle is what I felt. <laughs> <not playing. laughs> but if you're into pinball, like it's very interesting in how they do it. 
I, I'm going to say this. That I have the plot section here. This is kind of a joke because you could say that the plot is King DDD has taken over pinball land and it's up to Kirby to stop him. But the, the game doesn't say that. That's just kind of implied. So there's some some artistic license you can take with this, I guess, if you want to like, like... We're not fooling anybody here. We just wanted to make Kirby's yeah. little round puffball. We thought we could make a pinball game out of it. Yeah, if you, if you want to just like make your own story this is where you can write your own kirby fan fiction if you want to make a kirby pinball fan fiction that's all up to you but i did want to include the plot part because there really is no plot so let's talk about the development of this game and there's not really much data there's not really a lot of interviews or anything i could find about it but there is an interesting history with this about how laboratory specifically making pinball games so that's kind of what we're going to go over today because how laboratory actually made two pinball games before Kirby's Ooh. Pinball Land. So they were and, kind of pinball experts. This was yeah. taking two games that were successful for them and just putting them together, kind of. Yeah, and you can see the evolution over time, mm. which I thought was kind of interesting. So we're going to guys kind of talk about the evolution of these games. So the first game that came out was in 1984, and it was called Rollerball. Did not come out on the NES initially. It came out on an MSX computer, which I am unfamiliar with. Are you yeah, familiar a, with the MSX? It is a, a more popular gaming machine. Well, general purpose computer, but lots of games in uh, Japan. Okay. Uh, it's also the first system that the first Metal Gear came, game came out on. It was uh, not an NES game originally. It was an MSX game. Ooh, well, yeah. So it's an MSX game initially. And the it was entirely developed and published by HAL Laboratory. No Nintendo involved. But it was later ported to the NES in 1988. But this game introduced the idea of having multiple levels and screens. So in the game, it was just two screens. It was just a pinball table. But if you shot it up, it like moved the screen to the top of the pinball table and it moved it down. That's a really interesting way of uh, taking the so there's like the the con the like skeuomorphic concept of like taking a physical pinball table and like making a game out of it. That's cool. Uh, but what could you do in a game version of a pinball table that you might not be able to do in real life? And that's in a good example of something you could do. Like you can just change the whole pinball table if like you fulfill certain conditions, right? Which is, you can't do that in real life. Yeah. Which is like really... a cool way to, to take something that exists in real life and then what what can we do if we make a video game out of it is really cool. Yeah, and it's really cool how they did it too because also, and you don't really think of it this way, the NES version was more powerful than the msx version which is something we rarely say on this podcast the nes <laughs> being more powerful than something but because of that the nes version actually added some art so the nes version of rollerball has the new york city skyline mm -hmm. and the levels are based on the actual like where you're looking in the new york city skyline so there's actually four levels on the nes version right and the nes version at the very bottom has deep like you're looking at the ocean and then the next level up you're looking at the new york city harbor with like the statue of liberty and the skyline the next level above that is the empire state building and then the level above that is like a zeppelin in the cloud so that's how you know you're at like the top so they kind of give you an artistic expression of where you're at on the board which that's i thought cool. was pretty cool yeah so it's just weird to say you the go to NES, space eventually i mean Ideally, that would be perfect. If they, did, if they didn't run out of boards and memory, mm. they probably would have had you go to space. But I just think it's kind of cool that we could say the NES version was graphically and sound upgrade from the MSX version, which is not yeah. something we could say. I also but, like being able to see the like the early forms of the Kirby Pinball Land in earlier stuff that they had made. I think another good example of that, I think, happening in, in video games is like... Uh, harmonics made frequency and amplitude before they made Guitar Hero, right? And yeah. Those, those are some cool rhythm games that that were neat and they had some cool music. And then they did all the Guitar Hero stuff and that's really great. But then on uh, PSP, they put out Rock Band Unplugged, which was basically just uh, frequency or amplitude. It was like a kind of a mix between them, but then with, with the Rock Band aesthetic, uh, which is really cool. It was like when I played Rock Band Unplugged, I was like, oh, this is just like frequency or amplitude. That's kind of neat. That is cool. I like that. Have we have we covered these rhythm games yet? We still haven't done that. Yeah, I don't know. Gosh, I can't remember anything, man. Yeah. I can't remember anything about 300 that. episodes. We have no idea what's going on. So the second game that HAL Laboratory made was actually going to the Game Boy. So we're on the Game Boy now. And it was called Revenge of the Gator Pinball. Alligator themed pinball. Is wow. that what you wanted? Somebody pitched that and everybody in the room was like, that's the move. Yep, Gators. So 
So Rollerball had four screens, and I actually I think I might have misspoke. The MSX computer version had four screens too. The it wasn't added more screens for the NES. Sorry about that earlier. This just is a, better art on the. It's NES just better version. art. Yeah, it's a correction. Here, here comes a correction mid episode. This is perfect. So correction. That's right. Do we have corrections and apologies? No, we don't. We Not don't. Yet. Not yet. Okay. So this game was a total of seven screens to Rollerball's four screens, and the goal was to score as many points as possible and not let the alligator eat your pinball. Very good. Very easy goal to achieve, okay. right? But I love this game because the theme is just alligators. <laughs> they just were like, <laughs> we're just going to take an animal and we're going to build a whole a whole game out of it, right? And But what's cool is this looks a lot more like Kirby's Pinball Land. Like you can see the connection here with how it looks on the Game Boy. And you can tell this is the evolution for example, like I mentioned before, me getting obsessed with that chicken hatching game, there is a gator hatching egg game on Alligator Pinball. With um, like that's very much gator clearly like we game. took this and moved it to Kirby with chickens instead of gators, which I thought was kind of cool. So you could see this like egg breaking mechanic early on. So I think that's kind of all we could say about the development for Kirby's like Pinball Land, but. It's just kind of cool because we usually get like interviews with creators and stuff, but we can just look at the games themselves for this sense and get like a clear evolution going of what's mm -hmm. happening, which I thought was pretty cool. So legacy wise, I think Kirby's Pinball Land is a really cool take on pinball. And I'm sorry that I spoke so poorly of it last episode. <laughs> uh, please forgive me all you Kirby's Pinball Land stands out there. But the last note I will say about this, though, is Kirby's Pin Dreamland and Kirby's Adventure, which we talked about in episode one of the series, were designed for everyone to be, like, good at, right? Like, mm, anyone. They're, yeah, they're not game. very difficult games. Kirby's Pinball Land is not that game. And it is considered one of the hardest games on the Game Boy. Get <laughs> and good, I, Grub. And I, I think it's because it's just, like, a luck aspect to it, like a lot of pinball. So you could be really good at the game, but if you get a bad roll, it's just the way it is. You know what I mean? So... And I, when I, read the, I looked up this game and like just did some like internet research on it, it was a lot of like, why is Kirby's pinball so hard? <laughs> That's what I got. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, but I think I think uh, it's just it's just a fun little cool pinball game, and that's kind of what it is. And I I would encourage anyone to try it out. You know, if you got a way to play it, give it a go. So it's kind of it's kind of a silly, definitely more like a phone game. Like you play it, you lose, and you're like, well, that was a little fun entertainment for like five to ten minutes, and now I'm like doing something else. Which, yeah. It's neat. So, in my head canon of like the pitch meeting for this is like the person who made the the first two pinball games made those games, and then somebody else made these Kirby games, and uh, the the pinball guy brought his new game to the board and was like, "This is the game I want to make," and they're like, "Sorry, bud, we're doing Kirby games now," and he's so mad about it. He's like, "What? We used to be pinball games. Mm -hmm. Now we're doing Kirby games," and then he goes, "Okay." He takes it back to the drawing board. He comes back. He says, I still got a pinball game. They go, sorry, we're doing Kirby games. And he goes, it's a Kirby pinball game. Yeah. And then they you, said, you got sold. Perfect. I mean, Let's go. You're not wrong. I'm pretty positive <laughs> that the reason that this game exists, because it came out so quickly after Kirby's Dreamland, like it came out really quick. So I really think this was like, let's slap this IP that we know is popular now onto a pinball game to sell more copies. And it worked. And the, the fact that there's not a lot of changes between that and this uh, alligator game, it just like it's cosmetic, really, is yeah. that's why we have this. So let's just take our old game, slap a Kirby coat of paint on it. Mm -hmm. We're going to sell 2.19 million copies. Easy. Add some sweet bosses to it that mm -hmm. everyone loves, and then you're good to go. A so. flimsy story that lets other people fill in the blanks of whatever they want. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's play it. So I, I wanted to cover this one. And then I think the next Kirby episode we do, I am going to cover the mini golf game that Ooh. that was mentioned by, I believe Matt in Japan mentioned it in the Discord. So we Kirby will mini golf. There's a Kirby mini golf game, but called like Super Course or something like that. So we're going to we're going to try that out, too. But uh, we're going to move on now, though. Kirby's to Dreamland 2? A platforming game. Yeah, a true. I'm going to say a true, like a mainstay Kirby game. Yeah, right. Yeah, this is for sure mainline canon uh, Kirby. Mm -hmm. Um, so Kirby's Dream Land 2 is a game for the Game Boy as well, uh, developed by, these are the Grime Facts now, developed by Hell, Hell Laboratory, published by Nintendo, uh, released on March 21st, 1995, that's on the Game Boy, it's also, of course, available on the 3DS Virtual Console, which doesn't really exist, so if you missed it, you missed it, I guess. 
Um, it sold approximately 2.36 million copies. It is a platformer, like the first game. Um, and it takes about three, four hours to complete. A uh, speed run online I saw was like two hours, I think. Um, and uh, we don't really have a Metacritic score. Maybe we could find it. Uh, yeah, I'll look the, for the game ranking score. Yeah, the game ranking score. I think it's a generally a beloved game. I don't think we necessarily need to put a hard number on it. It is considered a fun game. People love this game. Um, yeah, I, can, I mean, I'm sure the game ranking score is online somewhere. Let me look. Um, oh, interesting. It's not. There's just like a lot of... But there are a lot of publication scores, like Electronic Gaming Monthly. Look at that, huh? That's EGM. What did EGM give it? Seven point six two five out of ten. Very specific. Six six point two five. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always think that those like super super precise review numbers are funny. I think EGM has like multiple people reviewing, and they kind of just do an average of of what their ratings are. So that would explain why it's yeah. so precise. Uh, but it's like, what's the difference between seven point? Two five and seven point three, you know. Yeah, this is seven point six two five from EGM. To give it like a little like Nintendo Power gave it a three point five two five out of five. Three point five two five. Yeah, Didn't and they, then they and to like show you the skew like in gaming, uh, in gaming reviews, the official Nintendo Magazine gave it a ninety three out of a hundred because it's the official Nintendo Magazine. <laughs> oh wait, there's there's the official Nintendo Magazine, but then also Nintendo Power because it looks Nintendo like Power it. Was, yeah, was the official Nintendo. I magazine. think I. This the official Nintendo magazine is a British magazine, so I think Ooh, maybe they had a different. Maybe Nintendo Power gotcha. didn't come to the UK. This would be a good thing to cover. We need to talk about these magazines. Yeah, journalism. The, the history of video mm -hmm. game journalism. That's mm -hmm. actually a really good idea. It is a really good idea. Did I tell everyone that I bought the Duke Nukem Strategy Guide? Did I tell everyone that? Yeah. I don't think I don't know if you did. I went back to that store, everybody in Bellingham, Washington, and I bought the Duke Nukem Forever Strategy Guide for ten dollars. And the Love person it. at the counter when I was buying it was looking at me like, and straight up was like this is a choice <laughs> <laughs> he said why are you handing me ten dollars the price tag here it actually says negative ten we says, give you ten dollars to, to take take it. this out of our store and i was like <laughs> well i just feel like it's one of those pieces of gaming history that no one wants and therefore i want it <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah i am now the proud owner of the duke nukem forever strategy guide any strategy questions for duke nukem forever feel free to email codex history podcast did you learn gmail. anything com. anything helpful is this going to help your speed run can you go for a world record of something in duke nukem forever Oh, could I be the Duke Nukem Forever champion? That's not a bad idea. This is something we need to look into. This is that's something a, we can look into. That's a button for the tangent yeah, button. I'm going to look. How funny would it be if I got a video game record in Duke Nukem Forever and I just oh, tried man. it because it's such a stupid thing to do. That sounds like something right up my alley. I'm into, I'm into doing Duke things that are like big achievements, but really dumb achievements. That's what I'm into. So. I and that nobody play. will challenge you on. No one will challenge me on it unless it gets really too popular. Then everyone, or will be you'll like, ignite uh, an entire speedrunning category. And I bring it, and I bring back Duke Nukem Forever. Oh man. yeah, this you'll get the. Be... Can't wait for the Summoning Salt video. Have you ever watched Summoning Salt videos on speedruns? Oh, you go into like really deep, like how these speedruns work. Um, I have to probably get a copy of it on 360 though to do this. Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. There's plenty of bugs in that game, though. We can find some exploits. We could do yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we'll, we'll over, talk. Everybody. We'll talk. We'll talk. Uh, so let's talk about Kirby's Dream Land 2, which is what we came here to do. Uh, the gameplay of it uh, is, I, I think, Kirby's Dream Land 2, gameplay-wise, more or less the same as the first one. There are some additions and stuff. But I, I think the, the interesting thing about it is that a, it's an example of a second-generation Game Boy game that improves upon the first one in every possible way. Uh, so like. The first game is just like it's a bog standard platformer. It's got a few levels in linear order. I think people like it because uh, Kirby's cute and the game is easy enough that you can feel very successful while you're playing it. It's good for kids who also, of course, love the, the cute little Kirby character. Um, and it's just it's just basic enough that everybody had a good time with it. Um, the second game is where they like they really expanded uh, about it. Um, uh, the first game reminds me a lot of Super Mario Land on the Game Boy that came out in 1989 because it's the same kind of thing. It's like, well, what if we just took Mario Bros. and put it on the Game Boy? How, <laughs> you know, how, how does that look? And it's like 12 levels and they just go in order and that's it. Um, but Dream Land 2, having had the benefit of an NES game in between games, Kirby's Adventure came out be between Dream Land 1 and 2. Um, it expanded on Dream Land in a huge way. So I I'm going to point to uh, Super Mario Bros. 3 as like a watershed moment in gaming. Um, that game came out in 1990 on the NES and Nintendo took a lot of what made that game great and they shrunk it down to the size of the Game Boy or how Laboratories did that. Um, 
So since uh, Sakurai was mostly busy working on Kirby Superstar um, and what would eventually become Super Smash Brothers, uh, they were working on that way early. Um, uh, Shinichi Shimomura stepped in to direct this game. Um, and the team expanded on the overworld that they included in Kirby's Adventure that we talked about. They added seven different worlds. And then within each world, you've got several different levels, each with different ending points and secrets to collect along the way. So if you play through this game once and you think you saw everything, you're wrong. You didn't see anything. <laughs> you saw a small portion of this game because there are so many different exits to each level. And like, you just, there's, yeah, seven worlds, three to five levels per world. Actually, there might be, I want to say some of the later worlds have like six or seven levels. Um, so there's just like, there's a ton to do here. And I think that makes it a perfect portable game for the time period because you have the satisfaction of being able to finish the game uh, in, a, in a run. Like if you're on a long car ride or something, you can, you can beat the game. You can see, you can roll credits in a few hours, right? Um, but then there's also tons of stuff for you to still continue finding later. You go back and play it again, you maybe skip this door and you go to a, a different door to exit the level and maybe you get a different power up and maybe that kind of stuff. Um, it did retain the copy ability from Adventure, keeping seven of those same abilities. So if Kirby eats an enemy uh, and swallows them, he gains an ability from them. And he can only hold one of those abilities at a time. So knowing which one will be useful in any given situation is one of the skills that the player is being tested on. And so that's another replay value, right? You say, oh, well, I went through this level before with the fireball. Maybe this next time I want to go through with the little boomerang thing. Um, and and you may open up different passage passageways or different places or different things may happen based on what abilities you had um which i think again more replay value plus yeah, it's all good oh this is my favorite part i'm so excited there's even more to this game there are three animal friends in this game which just expands upon the cuteness factor of the first game because you got rick the hamster oh, uh, this is rick Rick the it's just a Rick. It's the blue collar guy, Rick the hamster. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of just K I N E. Maybe it's Kine. I don't know. Um, and then I don't Koo know the owl. Koo um, the owl's on the nose a little bit. I think. Yeah, a little. I bit. like. I would want them all to have names like Rick, like Ted yeah. the owl. Yeah, Gary the fish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, Rick is like you're just your standard. Ah, hop on, ride on my back. Uh, kind gives Kirby the uh, a bit more maneuverability underwater. Um, Kirby can swim underwater, but when you're riding on the fish, you have a lot more. It's kind of like uh, the swordfish in uh, Donkey Kong Country. Um, shoot, what is the swordfish's name? Unguard. That's his name in uh, nice. Donkey Kong Country. That was a. I could tell you self testing yourself there. You're like, I should know this. Yeah, it's like I know, I know this. Um, is yeah, it's kind of similar to Unguard, although he doesn't. I don't remember him having an attack. It's it's been a few days since I played Kirby Streamland too. Um, and then Ku gives Kirby the ability to fly around, um, kind of like the parrot in later Donkey Kong Country games. Two and three has the parrot. You can kind of fly around with him. Um, uh, the, the You could also use copy abilities while flying on Ku. And, and the copy abilities that each, depending on which animal you're riding, the copy ability will change. So you've got seven abilities plus times three different things you can ride plus the, the copy ability on its own. That's 28 different abilities in this game. A lot of abilities. For, yeah, and this is a Game Boy game. Yeah, depending on how you mix and match your animal companions or don't have an animal companion, you have different kinds of abilities. Um, so the game itself is just huge and expanded, but retains this like fe this very manageable feeling and the replayability, which I think is super important for a portable game, uh, especially back in those days. Because when you brought your Game Boy, you brought one or two games, and that was it. And you weren't going to go to the app store and buy a new game, download new games. That was it. Your road trip game was your road trip game. And if you finished it, you hit that restart button and you just did it again. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. Because the Game Boy back in those days, it's still to this day, but like back in those days, was very much like a thing parents handed to their kids on the road trip and was like, please don't be a pain while we sit in this car for hours and hours and hours. News for kids like me. Yeah, and the same. Uh, so, yeah, having a lot of content in one game is a huge plus. Um, and I think that's one of the complaints about the first game was that it was really fun, really cute. We we love it, but there's just, once you beat it, you kind of, that's it. Maybe you play it a couple more times, but it sort of runs out of novelty pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Dreamland 2 has a lot of novelty to it. That's really cool. I mean, I love the animal writing, like, sub, like, addition to the game. Like, yeah. It made it really fun for me when I was playing it, too, because I also played it a little bit because I was like, well... With the Kirby games, you and I both kind of want to do this together. Like, we usually do one game a person, and we, like, go back and forth. But, like, you no, know, Kirby, we're doing it together. Because we both don't know Kirby, which has been... Yeah. This has been a thrill ride, honestly. Yeah. It's, kind of, it's really fun. Uh, a real gap in my gaming resumes. Me too, but not anymore. 
not anymore. I played a bunch of Kirby games now, mm-hmm. and I'm going to keep playing more Kirby games because we are not even close to being done here talking about Kirby games. That's right. There's so many Kirby games, everybody. It's going to be a long. It's going to be a long road. You're going to be so sick of that that beautiful pink puff ball by the time we're done with this. You're going to be yeah. so over it. Watch the Brian David Gilbert video on him trying to figure out what what Kirby is, Kirby. is. <laughs> <laughs> also we could do kirby and just roll right into super smash brothers as well true true but you have another one that we're going to talk about at the end of the episode that i'm excited to do episodes on as well because i am unfamiliar with what you've been playing and we're oh yeah oh, i'll yeah. talk about it in the what you've been playing yeah we're going to leave a little, little little breadcrumb here for people to stick, stick around, around. Mm-hmm. yeah um so back to kirby's dreamland too though like any game like that the game start or the level start off easy uh, but then the further in you get of course the better you need to be um you can blast through the game in an hour if you know what you're doing uh but getting to that point is going to take you a long time it's going to take a lot of reps to learn the levels to learn the best ways to get out of there you you're not going to actually turn your game boy on and be done in an hour of if you've never played this game before right um and you want to hunt down all the secrets you want to get good at all the little mini games every world has little mini games in between them uh it's a lot of the same mini games from kirby's adventure a lot of dreamland 2 is taking what they learned uh in kirby's adventure and sort of shrinking it down expanding on it as well um but it's really kind of the portable version of kirby's adventure uh with some extra content all the levels are different of course but uh it is g- gameplay wise or s- spirit wise it feels kind of like the, the natural evolution of kirby's adventure mm-hmm. um each world also has a rainbow sword piece to pick up. And if you get all the rainbow sword pieces from across the game, that's when you get to fight the real boss at the end. So like a classic 90s game, it's not the real boss until you've gone through and collected all of the small little thingies you need to collect. Like in uh, Sonic, you got to collect all the Chaos Emeralds to get to the real final boss, right? Um, at least in Sonic 2 and 3 and Knuckles. Um, and you had to get good at games t- to do that remember when you had to get good at games to finish them like finishing a game meant you were good at the game nowadays finishing a game means you just put in the time and finished it yeah i, I and, mean i'm honestly as an as an old man gamer now i feel pretty good about the way it is now because i know i do too games and yeah that's not necessarily a dig at how games are today because games are much more plot focused and it would feel really bad if you were not able to see the ending of a game because your skill wasn't quite there mm-hmm. and then that's of course as us as adults i'm like i'm not going to put in reps just to get good at this game so i can see the ending yeah I games are more accessible now and i think that's the key yeah yeah but back in the back in the day when the the stories were simple you weren't really trying to see the end of kirby's dreamland you know the story is yeah is enough to like get you from level to level but you don't really care that much um, exactly but, but beating the game meant that you were good at the game uh, for sure and not everybody got there um which was uh just how games used to be more often uh, i'm sure there are plenty of games like that nowadays but uh that's that's how they used to be um so yeah there's a there's a real boss so let's talk about the plot then the simple plot um the rainbow bridges between the worlds have been broken by dark matter uh, and Kirby's got to collect all the pieces of the Rainbow Sword and defeat King DDD, the fu- the boss, and then Dark Matter, who's the real final boss. If you don't get all the Rainbow Swords, you know Dark Matter's still out there, and you got to go get those Rainbow Swords. Um, and he's got to do that, and he's got to save everybody. And this time, he's got his animal friends to help. And that's it. That's the story. It, it's There's some motivation, something to look forward to. It's not winning any narrative awards. That's okay. It's a Game Boy game from 1993. It's just there to... The plot's just there to move you along. And, and to give you a... a something extra to shoot for when you beat the boss in roll credits or when you beat King DDD in roll credits, you know, there's a little more out there that if you were just a mm-hmm. little better at the game, you'd have got those rainbow swords and you'd be able to fight dark matter with the rainbow. That's right. Also, it's, it's, it's a good plot in our hearts. You know, it's, it's, it's yeah. what it is. If you're a kid, it's just, just enough, you know? Yeah. This is definitely the, like the depth of a plot you would do for like a kid's TV show. You know, you'd be like, Oh, Kirby's got to find the seven rainbow sword pieces. And he would find one, sword piece every season and we'd run the show for 10 years Mm -hmm. and everybody would be an adult by the time kirby beat dark matter yeah and then we'd all cry because we've been watching the show for 10 years Mm -hmm. wow i just we we just went on a journey there (laughs) we did we did but i I, it was a beautiful journey beautiful journey lines we did yeah all right well the development of this game um unlike the first two was directed by a whole another team of folks which i think was probably good for it because it let them uh really go for some stuff that um expanded and and just made the original games where they brought some new fresh ideas um so a lot of that team was also new to developing games which was really good for how labs because that gave them the opportunity to level up some of their more junior staff members um and then of course their fresh perspectives brought fun ideas to the game and ultimately made it as good as it is i think that's kind of an under thought about thing um in video game development is like the talent that it takes to 
to build those games and how you're not just you're not just born good at games you got to build that talent and so um this was a, an interesting way that the, the stuff that i found out of like these junior staff members of like give them something to to practice on i guess right and to get better at i think is really cool and something that um not everybody thinks about when it comes to developing games it's like they could have put all of their best people on every game uh but then who's gonna do it after those people retire so you got to make sure you've got like a bench of people that can can jump in and like make more and more good games i think that's really cool yeah i mean also because we talk about how you take away original creators from games and then sometimes the games are not as good mm -hmm. but it can go the other way too just like you're saying where it's like a new fresh look on this could add more to it and make it better and i think that's like that's what gave us those animal companion friends that we all loved. Yeah, so. yeah. And I think Sakurai still kept an eye on things and like mm -hmm. probably gave feedback and things like that. I think he uh, is a bit of a, a Miyamoto-like figure in that uh, in that sense of like, Miyamoto made a bunch of great games. There are a lot of games he didn't make directly, but he was sort of consulted on or, or at least had gave feedback on. And those games tend to do really, really well while also allowing those uh, junior team members to build up their skills too. So they're kind of guided by Miyamoto. Or Again, I think that's really cool. I think it's pretty safe to say that Tyler and I are big fans of Nintendo, um, but it's also because if you notice, they don't lay off employees like other companies do mm -hmm. too, and they actually grow their employees into making them into good game designers. And it's just like a very refreshing thing to see in yeah. the age of 2024 when there's a lot of layoffs going on. That Nintendo's not doing that. It yeah. feels it feels good. So. Yeah. Uh... Yeah, so I can't find a whole lot else uh, around the development of this game specifically, which is like classic for 90s video games that just sort of made it. It doesn't seem like there was any drama going on behind the scenes. Um, I do think that the director of this, uh, Shinichi Shimomura, I think he did a great job. It was his first game, and then he went on to work on Dreamland 3, Kirby 64, a bunch of other Kirby games. I'm a little bummed by it because it seems like all he did were Kirby games, and I would have liked to see him do some stuff with with other games. Like he he made a bunch of really great Kirby games, but then that's it. He didn't make any other, he didn't test his skills in anything else. Maybe he just made a bunch of money off those Kirby games and retired. And if he did, that I, I respect that. Good on you. you know? Yeah, I respect uh, making your bag and then leaving. Mm -hmm. um, also, Kirby's Dream Land 2 supports the Super Game Boy peripheral for the Super Nintendo, which I had as a kid, no big deal. Uh, and it uh, adds a little bit of color to the game, adds a fun custom border to it, and I think some extra sound effects as well, because there's a, a the, the they could tap into the Super Nintendo sound chip from Game Boy games on the Super Game Boy, which was cool. That is cool, but no big deal that you had it. You're not bragging or anything. I'm not bragging or anything, but I did have. But a he Super did Game own Boy. it. Yeah, he I did, did have play it. a lot of Pokemon on my TV. Nice. Which also had uh, Super Game Boy enhancements. Nice. Uh, same kind of thing. Extra colors. Uh, red or blue version uh, border when you're playing the game is kind of cool. Uh, so the legacy of uh, Kirby's Dream Land 2. I think the Kirby series itself is interesting because it's one that started life as a portable game, but then it kind of got elevated to home console status with the NES and the Super Nintendo games. Um, and then oftentimes we'll see like flagship uh, console games get portable entries, uh, like Super Mario Brothers got Super Mario Land. Uh, but you don't really consider Super Mario Land like a, a mainline super mario game it's not mm -hmm. a super mario brothers game it's just the portable version that you play in the car uh when you can't play the actual game that you want to play which is the the console version right um but uh, uh i think this one is cool to see that it went the other way it started out as a portable game and then became a console game um but it still kept true to its uh, portable roots like the, it uh had lots of portable games just the series in general lots of portable games as the series drags on um but uh uh it, it sort of flourished into being both a console and portable thing. I think it was really cool. A little bit more rare to see things go from portable to console in that way. Yeah. Um, I'd like to say that this is like a solid late era Game Boy game, uh, but honestly, it's not late era. The Game Boy Color didn't even come out until several years later. And then even then, I'm not sure I'd consider that like a new generation of Game Boy games. Uh, it really doesn't turn over the generation until the Game Boy Advance uh, comes out. So you're... It, this is not like a later Game Boy game, but mm -hmm. it does, it did uh, seem to learn a lot or or uh, maybe inform, uh, I mean, I'm not sure the exact release order of these games, but uh, uh, Super Mario Land 2, which I think kind of did the same thing where it was like, okay, take the first game, let's add an overworld to it, uh, some level of non-linearity between you can, about being able to choose which levels you do and then beating the bosses and then having to beat all of the bosses to be able to beat the final boss. Um, I think it's uh, uh, a cool evolution of, those games and uh 
the, at least these two series did it in that way. And there's probably other games that did that where they had like a linear first game, a second game with an overworld and some nonlinearity. Uh, so if you know of any uh, other series that have a similar trajectory, I'd love to hear about that because I, I, I love seeing the parallels in uh, games throughout history, uh, especially, you know, uh, parallel series like the Kirby series and the Super Mario series. Yeah. Um, so yeah, massive leap in quality between this game and the, the game before it. Um, and this game is way better. There's really no reason to go back to Dreamland One unless you've got nostalgia for it, and you mm -hmm. or you just want to see where the game, where the series started. Um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, that's it. That's uh, Kirby's Dreamland Two. We did it. I forgot about Kirby Sixty Four, and I'm excited to talk about that when we get to that because I oh yeah, played... I I played a little bit of Kirby Sixty Four the other night. So you did uh, okay. That's a Sixty Four game I haven't touched at all. So I'm excited. Yeah. I don't know. Do you know anything uh, about it? Like, are you no? Because you would think that it is like a the Super Mario sixty four version of. Kirby. Is it not that? It's not. It's still a side scroller. It's still a, like a two D. Uh, Interesting. Uh, it's a three D two D where it's like it's all polygons and stuff, uh, but it is still a side scroller. I wonder if it's on the emulator on Switch. It probably is. It might, oh, be. Look. It might be. Yeah, we'll take a look. Yeah, but I... that's kind of all I got for for Kirby's Dream Land too. It was good. It was good stuff, though. We got good stuff in today. I'm excited. Yeah. So, yeah. so well, what you been playing, Mike? Ooh, you beat me to it. Well, Tyler and I have been playing Deadlock together, that mm -hmm. new Valve game, and that's pretty cool. It's like, yeah. got the beginnings. Now that I know what like a MOBA is, because we played League of Legends together and stuff, Like, I, I feel like I grasp what they're doing with the game. It's very interesting, because if you'd have told me that Valve's next game was going to be a third-person shooter MOBA, I would have not called that at all but that's a very valve thing to do that seems so, like something that would have happened 10 years ago yeah and so still it, been too late to the party exactly but it's fun it's a fun game and we had like kind of a comeback last night yeah when we played it which was really a cool thing because that's kind of why what keeps me in like games like league of legends is when you're down and then you think it's all over and everyone's like we should surrender and you're like nah let's not surrender let's just play it out and then you win it mm -hmm. feels like so good it's like the feeling that everyone worked like wants you know in a video yeah. game like that so we had that last night with Deadlock, and that was pretty neat. I've been really hitting it hard on the Minecraft realm that I pay for, and we're talking about maybe migrating it to an actual server that you have at some point, which is kind of like a fun little project. But yeah, it's it's not really like anything we have to do. We're kind of just looking over it because it's just another fun thing to play with when you have a server, All right, Tyler? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll make it work. I, I'm yeah, we can make it work. But you, you got it. What's funny is I told you about that and then you're like, try this and you just had a random one running within like 20 minutes. <laughs> I was like, yeah, it does. It doesn't take very long. Uh, when I have, I have all of the infrastructure set up. So just spinning up a new thing is uh, not very difficult. Yeah, but I was like, that's really cool because now I'm playing on Tyler's server. He's got a world in his house. Yep. The world. server sits in my mm -hmm. closet. That's right. It's a closet world. That's yep. what they call it. We should change the name of it to that. So uh, it's been really fun, though. And I haven't really played any new games other than those two. I'm really falling off the Destiny train because I'm just kind of like, and eh, there's other things coming out. And then Space Marine 2 comes out very soon. And I am really excited for that game. I am not pre-ordering it, though, because I'm really trying to do the vote with my wallet on pre-orders and that I don't want to do that anymore um, because it's just one of those things that's... Well, digital games, why pre-order? Yeah, it's carried, over. it's carried over and it's unnecessary. It's just a way to get yeah. sales early. And I want to see what the game's like before it comes out. Because I, while it looks really good and it could be really fun, you never know these days. Games come out all the time and they're like half finished and I don't mm -hmm. want to be caught that way. But what you been playing, Tyler? Well, I've been playing Deadlock with you and um, I'm, we've, I've probably played three or four matches now. Uh, and it it's definitely at the stage... We're at we're at the stage in learning a new MOBA where it's like I don't know what any of this is and I'm scared and uh, <laughs> like it's just it, we're just a, a it's just about putting reps in right now like you you can't learn it all beforehand you won't learn it all in one game uh, there's like 20 different heroes or whatever they're called in this game um, to to play as and it's really just like do you like do you do you like uh, the overall sort of idea of what a MOBA is if so. You're going to have to put in like 40, 50 hours before you really know if you like this game or not. Um, yeah, it's got that like magical, like 1920s city vibe. Yeah, it. it does have like, a cool aesthetic to it. It's, it's really like cool. sort of like TF2, but a little bit more. Yeah, it, it, it's I, I really like it. I the character, the thing I like about it, too, that kind of opened my mind up to the game and really changed and helped me out is 
and if you, anyone's played the game, you might know this already, but I didn't know it. And our friend Aaron showed it to us. Uh, listen to the High Road podcast, everybody. And it is a, if you open the game, there's like a moment where you're like sitting there waiting for the match to start. If you go to builds, uh, you can look at the most popular build and just select that as what you're building. And that makes the game a lot easier as far as like not having to learn. It's kind of yeah. like with... um wild rift for league of legends mobile just pick the most popular build and just use that because yeah. there's there's nerds out there that figure this out for you just play the game like they do for now yeah <laughs> and once you, once you know enough about the game yeah. that you can start that you have some extra brain power to devote to starting to optimize your stats and like for your play style that's fine but until then do not concern yourself with such uh, uh complicated matters because you need to learn how the map is laid out and you need to learn mm -hmm. the firing rate of your gun and what your abilities do um, and you need to do that every time you play a new uh, hero. So uh, don't worry about the builds part. Just let someone else do that for you. And then once you're good enough to be thinking about it yourself, then you'll think about it yourself. Yeah. And it's fine. So props to all the people that decided to make all those builds in two weeks into this game and know what they're doing. Because I yeah. am lost without you. Also, yeah. I love that the, vo the, the, the vocabulary is the same. Like... If someone goes to me and they're like, oh, Baron's up, we know what it is. It's not Baron, but we know what it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I'm jungling. It's like, okay, they're not in lane. Okay, we got it. We're figuring it out. Like, the, the, yeah. the, the lingo is the same. Or at least we use the same lingo. I don't know, because mm -hmm. I, I we don't. I haven't talked you. to strangers while playing this game. I, I think we're people. just doing it. I bet you people, because this could be a lot of carryover from other MOBAs, people that yeah. play like Dota 2 or people that play League and I, or even Pokemon Smite. Like, I bet you there's people using the vocabulary from those games while playing Deadlock for sure. Yeah, you're probably right. But I, I love that, that everyone's like, we're going to go do Baron. Well, I don't even know what the actual boss's name is, but it's the giant boss monster in the middle of the map. And we're just yeah. going to go there. <laughs> it sort of reminds me of like a bigger version of, uh, there's like two people that are going to remember this game, uh, Monday Night Combat or Super Monday Night Combat. I really like Super Monday Night Combat. Um, it's sort of a bigger version of that game because um, that game had a lot of the same stuff of like choosing a hero and using their abilities and, and uh, the minions are like little, little robots that run down the lane for you. Um, yeah, that was a fun game that came and went immediately. It was is like, it dead? Is it like a dead oh, it was dead yet? within like a week because they accidentally uh, published it too early, I think. And I, I got the feeling that they just got sad that they published it too early and then just gave up. I don't really know what happened there with that game because it was really maybe, fun and I thought people were enjoying it. But. Maybe it's worth an episode. If we, because we do love a dead game yeah. around here, we do That's love talking true. about a dead game. We love Maybe that. Maybe I can find somebody who worked on that game and like Ooh. talk to them, be like, "What happened here?" Because I was having a lot of fun with this game. I thought people were really enjoying it, and I know they put it out like a week before they wanted to, and then it was like on actual launch day when it was supposed to launch. Game was dead, and they weren't doing anything with it, and then they just shut it down. All right. Well, well it probably well, still runs, but I, yeah, they just had they like gave up on it very quickly. I don't know. We have two missions now. Okay, your mission is to look up Super Monday Night Combat and try to figure out what happened. My mission is to see what the speed run record is on Duke Nukem Forever. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go to Twin Galaxies. Twin Galaxies. Okay, because we're we're gonna find this out. I think it'd be Duke very funny. Nukem Forever. To 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 use spend time on a game that most people don't like and try to get a record. <laughs> Twin Galaxies King. Twin oh, I should also mention while you're looking that up, I did do I did have an accomplishment that's not that's gaming related, but not video gaming related. I finally dungeon mastered a D and D game, a modular. I did Curse of Strahd, and my team actually finished it. The Ooh. party, the, the the biggest raid boss of them all, scheduling almost tried to kill us, but we passed. Scheduling did not TPK us. Okay, we actually and they and they beat Strahd, and I was playing him like a real jerk, and they still beat him. So I'm I'm proud of them. So I even prefaced it. I was like, just so you guys know, I'm going to play him from the book. And I'm going to play them the way they say to. And it's very annoying. And just just do your best. And they all did their best. And they all they all won, which made me happy. Because I was worried I was going to kill them there for a second. I charmed yeah. someone. And they're, I charmed their high-level wizard. And he started <laughs> yucking spells at their uh, at the team. And they, they managed to polymorph him into a crab, which was really funny. I thought, <laughs> stop him. So he just became a crab. And it was really good. I got Duke Nukem records. Are you ready for this? I'm ready for it. There are none. Nothing on Twin Galaxies. Total record zero. This is my time to shine, everyone. This is it. This is it. This is my time. You Are gotta go back. You're gonna have to play it again because you probably have to record a whole video. You need to figure out what the rules are. 
I got to figure out what the rules are. I got to play it again. I got to look into it. It's not, I mean, there's going to be exploits that I got to do, right? That's like, that's like the key to speed running is like, well, finding... you don't have to do anything right now. You just finish the game and submit that and you're, you're the world record holder. Oh, but I kind of want to, there's nothing, there's literally nothing there. So I got to submit a time and then I got to be like, this and then you got to my... be refining it. And then I got to refine my time. All right, everyone. This is the day. This was the day a speed runner was born. Everyone. Are you going to be one of those? Are you going to be a streamer speedrunner that just like mm -hmm. speed runs your? Mm -hmm. and I'm going to be like runs? I'm going to I'm going to be the one to speed run Duke Nukem forever because no one cares and I end up but I care. You can I have can't a wait to drive in a little spend twelve hours just streaming mm -hmm. Duke Nukem. Mm -hmm. Stream Duke Nukem forever twelve hours. Wife leaves me all alone living in an apartment by myself. Speed running Duke Nukem forever. And I'll and I'll get one second off my time and I'll be like, it was all worth it. <laughs> smoking a cigarette alone. <laughs> oh, we went on a journey again. Okay, everyone, we got to end yeah. this episode. We've been going. But, well, through... well, okay. I know I'm not done. I haven't, I haven't done talking about what I'm playing. I also have been playing Paper Mario. Oh, we of course. How do we forget this? Okay, yeah, keep going. Yeah, the the, the original Nintendo 64 version of Paper Mario. Mm -hmm. um, I'm playing it in an emulator on uh, one of my PC handhelds um, that I have hooked up to my TV. I've got a really neat setup with this with this thing. I'll have to show you at some point, Mike. Yeah, do because um, I have a, a A Neo Air One S. Um, which is uh, it's about the size of a Switch Lite, but it is a full PC that runs PC games. You got to turn the settings down, but it'll, it pretty much runs anything. You just have to turn the settings down. Um, and I have a little $7 uh, HDMI adapter thing that I plug into it, and I plug the power into it, and I hook that up to my TV, and then I sync up my Brawler 64 controller or my PlayStation 4 controller or any Bluetooth controller. I've done the Switch Brawler controller. Brawler 64 controller is the key. And because it's running Steam OS. Or Steam Fork, technically, it's not uh, Steam OS technically, but it is basically Steam OS. It works just like a console. It feels like a console. There's no like PC. Uh, I mean, there's some stuff because I'm I'm running Steam OS on a device that it was not designed for. So there's like things that I have to deal with. But the actual experience when it's working well, there's no like PC Windows stuff in the background. Uh, there's no like other BS going on. It just feels like a, a Steam console. It's really really cool. Um, and I highly recommend folks, especially if you have a, an AMD graphics card in your computer to give a, give these, uh, gaming Linux distributions a try because they feel like a console in a way that I've never had a PC feel like a console before. I've always, I boot up like big picture mode on my, my desktop PC. I'm like, Oh, it feels like a console, but there's still like some windows stuff happening in the background. Sometimes like you're playing a game and like, you know, a notification pops up and now, uh, your game is not in focus and you, if you don't have a mouse and keyboard to like click on the game again you're like kind of having a bad time on your tv um but with steam os that doesn't happen it's very cool i just really enjoying it so uh, but yeah paper mario is great having a lot of fun uh can't believe i slept on this game growing up uh i just never played it and it's it's a it's kind of the the next evolution uh past super mario rpg it's uh, got a very different 2d 3d aesthetic every all of the characters are like 2d paper things but it's takes place in a in a technically 3d world but it is very much focused on going left to right or right to left within that 3d world and like maybe forward and back a bit but it's a kind of a fixed camera angle um and then all the battles are turn-based same as super mario rpg where uh you you like are rewarded if you can time your button presses to either defend or um attack and then every every attack has like a different thing you have to do to make it work better some of them are like mash the A button a whole bunch of times. Some of them are time the A button. Some of them are like flick the joystick in a certain way. Um, so you're like, it's like JRPG, but you're still actively taking part. Um, and then a lot of the standard JRPG systems with math are just like out of the game. Like uh, you it's level simpler, up. Right? Yeah, it's much simpler. You level up, but then you get to choose if you want more health, if you want more uh, magic points. They're called flower, flower points, but they're basically MP. Uh, or if you want more badge points, which uh, badge points kind of let you equip sort of uh, abilities or or passive abilities. Um, and so the more points you have, the more badges you can equip. Um, it reminds me of like the AP system in Kingdom Hearts where you have like a certain number of AP and then you can equip different things. And some of them are passive buffs. Some of them are uh, active abilities. Um, but yeah, it's it's a lot of fun. And then, of course, finding all the badges as you go throughout the game is really good. It's really funny. The game is just like cute. The story is, is just cute and fun. Um, so I recommend it. I'm like... 14 hours in now and i think it's about 20 25 hours so i'm like a little over halfway i've got four of the seven stars 
that you're trying to get. Ooh. And then after that, I might move on to Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga. I'm not sure if I want to do... I'm doing all these Mario RPG games now, and I'm not sure if I want to do uh, like do them in release order, where I play Super Mario RPG, Paper Mario, Mario and Luigi Superstar Saga, and then like Thousand Year Door, or if I want to uh, just play all the Paper Mario games and then go back and play all the Mario and Luigi games. I haven't really decided yet. That's cool, though. And we could do episodes on these, too, which yeah. I know people are big fans of these games. And I've yeah. played a little bit of the N64 Paper Mario. Like, I played probably an hour. It was fun. Yeah. But yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I need to boot it back up again because I think that's definitely on the Switch emulator. As yeah, well. and they're want to play it. It's on there. They're just, they're just great, like uh, baby's first JRPG, um, because they're so simple, but they still have a lot of the satisfaction that comes from leveling up in a JRPG. This one is even simpler than the original Mario RPG, um, uh, and I think the Paper Mario series goes a little bit more in the the simplifying of of the RPG stuff direction, while the Mario and Luigi series goes more into the uh the rpg stuff so they're both cool i think some people get a little disappointed with some of the later paper mario games because they don't feel like rpgs as much um but the mario and luigi games do so play those games and there's a new one coming out in november that's why i'm on this kick that to bring it all around i'm on this kick because i want to play the new mario and luigi brothership game in november when it comes that out that looks really Switch. cool yeah and so i want to like play it so maybe i'll move on to the mario and luigi series so i can get the storyline from there and then I'll, maybe i'll play the paper mario games as well but nice well that's yeah. exciting so there's more kirby coming our way there's mm -hmm. going to be more paper mario mario rpg stuff coming our way yep and then yeah so that's so we'll probably do another kirby one is my guess the next time um but yeah so that's it for today as always, Codex History Podcast at gmail.com is our email. You can go to codexpodcast.net if you want to go to any of our links are on there, Discord, all that jazz. But with that, Tyler, do you want to say bye to everybody? Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>